I wanted to first start by thanking uh, my colleague at Auburn University who recommended me here to the Architreats uh, before I even started at Auburn. Um, her name is Catherine Braun. You might have met her here. Um, she gave a talk a couple months ago. Um, and I also wanted to thank, of course, Shailen Ameo for organizing everything, uh, making the arrangements. I am actually really excited to be here because even though I've given many talks on this topic, this is my first time in Alabama. Uh, so unlike many of my previous audiences, I suspect that most of you are somewhat familiar with the location of my talk. Who here has never visited Huntsville, Alabama? Very few, right? Okay, so you've been there, right? I also suspect that even if you have not visited yet, you know how important the space industry has been to the town's prosperity, and I probably do not need to introduce you to Werner von Braun and his German rocket team. I'm going to give you a brief overview I have lived more years of my life in the United States than in Germany, I spent most of my formative years, that's high school and young adulthood, in Germany, which clearly influences how I think about the world, but most definitely how I think about the Third Reich and the Nazi regime. And while I believe that my background is a plus for this project, it is also a difficulty because it makes the topic more immediately personal. <laughs> I literally grew up with family members who experienced World War II from opposing sides. But for all intents and purposes, my families on both sides of the Atlantic are middle class white Christians. So they belong to the racially and religiously privileged majority within their societies. It may therefore not be too surprising that I chose a topic that allows me to grapple head on with both cultures that I grew out of. Since this is fairly recent history, it is also quite personal and sometimes emotionally charged for the people I interviewed. I think it is safe to say that most of my interviews were excited that I wanted to write about the German families in Huntsville, but also concerned about how I would tell their story. So in order to offer balanced and meaningful history, I have tried to navigate the fine line between scholarly detachment and remaining empathetic to all of those involved, especially because one of my hopes was, and still is, to stimulate a conversation, which won't work if the potential conversation partners feel they have to be on the defensive from the beginning. Worst case scenarios, they will not even show up in the first place. I have to admit, I was actually not familiar with the history of Werner von Bonn and his rocket team when I first learned about the German community in Huntsville. When I had a chance to meet some of the family members, I listened intensely to their stories about how they came to the United States and what it has been like to live in Huntsville. But I was mainly interested in them for their uniqueness as a fairly large and homogenous immigrant group that had come to the United States after World War II. As you might imagine, it did not take long for me to run into some diametrically oppositional portrayals of the team once I started my research. Some characterized them as national heroes who helped us, the U.S. win the Cold War, while others described them as Nazi villains. As hard as I tried in the beginning, there was no way that I could avoid dealing with their pasts in Nazi Germany. When this topic came up in preliminary exchanges, however, I started to notice something that I was really not familiar with growing up in Germany. My conversation partners often became immediately defensive and dismissive about any suggestion that the Rocketeers might have been more than innocent bystanders to what was happening under the Nazi regime. This reaction was puzzling to me because I grew up in a Germany that had been trying to deal with its Nazi past since the end of the war, which meant that most people today realize that things were not that simple, that few people were entirely evil or entirely innocent. So I wanted to understand why some people in Huntsville, and not just the Germans themselves, mind you, had so little nuance in their evaluation of the Rocketeers' past. 
In order to do this, I availed myself of a concept that I grew up with. Let's see if I can bring this up. Yeah. Lovely German word, <coughs> Vergangenheitsbewältigung. So, Vergangenheitsbewältigung is a term that describes the relating to, coping, and struggling with the Nazi past and the Holocaust. The expression emerged in the latter half of the 1950s and can be seen as a self-imposed extension of allied post-war denazification and re-education efforts. It really became a more prominent feature of German identity when the second generation confronted their parents who were adults during the regime in an attempt to understand how the Nazis could have become so powerful. In most cases, however, the war generation refused to talk about their experiences, be it out of shame, pain, or resentment over what had happened, but probably also over the indirect accusations. I use this concept because it gives me a way to compare and contrast how Hans Williams made sense of the German rocketeers' past in an environment that was very different from that of Germans grappling with their family's Nazi past in Germany. The most obvious difference is that people in Germany were reinventing a new nation from the ashes of World War II, while von Braun's rocket team was able to leave Germany with its problematic past and join the victorious nation that was now, more than ever, considered a world leader. Huntsville was reinventing itself as well when the Germans arrived, but under very different conditions. All right, but let me now give you the brief overview I promised and provide a summary of what I learned from my archival research and interviews. Werner von Braun and his German colleagues were initially brought to the United States under a military project named Operation Paperclip. Even before World War II officially ended in the European theater, the Allies' intelligence units had searched Germany for specialists in anything from aerodynamics and rocketry to chemical weapons and medicine. The US undertaking Paperclip, which initially was named Overcast, brought more than 500 specialists to the United States between 1945 and 52. While the specialists had voluntarily signed short-term contracts with the US military, the enterprise was considered a form of intellectual reparations. And it was limited to temporary exploitation after which the specialists would be returned to Europe, which was, by the way, the fate of most Germans who were brought to the Soviet Union. A new directive issued in March 1946 changed this initial goal. It included the possibility of eventual citizenship as well as long-term contracts. The new goals were first to keep the specialists from falling into the hands of other nations, and secondly, to take advantage of the potential long-term benefits of having these experts work for American national security and industry. Now, as you might imagine, or some of you may even remember, there was some public criticism of offering US citizenship to people who had worked for the Nazi regime, especially in light of the fact that many survivors of the Holocaust could not gain entry into the US at the time. <clears throat> but that criticism faded with the Displaced Persons Acts of 1948 and 50, and in light of new concerns over national security emerging out of the Cold War. One of the larger groups brought to the United States under paperclip was von Braun's rocket team that had developed the V2 rocket, which was known primarily as one of Hitler's so-called vengeance or wonder weapons, with which he promised that Germany would win the war as late as 1944. From the standpoint of national security, it made good sense to take advantage of these experts, so the US Army had permission to bring a relatively small selection of von Braun's team to the country. About 120 out of several thousands who had assisted in developing the V2. The group was vetted and brought to Fort Bliss in Texas, where they showed the Army how to assemble and launch V2 rockets at White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico using the parts that the US military had collected in Germany. Their dependents were allowed to join them within one or two years and the families remained in the area until 1950, while the team continued to consult military and industry in guided missile research. All right, and here you have an iconic picture of the team in Fort Bliss. It was taken in 1946. I was told by one of them that some who were there did not participate in the picture taking. <coughs> Others only arrived in late 1947 and early 1948. 
And for those of you interested, this is the one time I'll use my pointer. Um, von Braun is the seventh figure from the right in the front row. And I, good, I can't see it as well. This is him right here. All right? Okay. When the directive came that they could apply for U.S. citizenship, it took the war, state, and justice departments another two years to agree on a procedure that would satisfy the requirements that no so-called ardent Nazis, or worse yet, war criminals, would be allowed to become U.S. citizens. So most of the Rocketeers and their descendants began the application process while they were still in Texas. In 1949, the Army decided to consolidate its rocket development program. Since Huntsville Arsenal was advertised for sale and the adjacent Redstone Arsenal had been put on standby status after the war, the Chief of Ordnance consolidated the two and reactivated Redstone Arsenal as the site for the Army's emerging rocket development programs. So, in 1950, almost all of the German rocket team members and their families, families sorry, followed the army to Huntsville, joined by thousands of other newcomers from across the country. The once small cotton mill town that proudly proclaimed itself watercress capital of the world had already gone through some serious growth spurts to accommodate the many new job seekers when the arsenals were first built during World War II. But now it was facing another immense expansion. As you can see here, the population was 16,437 when the Rocketeers and their families arrived, and by 1960 that number had almost quadrupled thanks to the influx of newcomers, but also due to the annexation of surrounding areas. And NASA's arrival in 1960 meant another immense growth spurt, bringing the population up to 137,802 by 1970. And as you can see, the German families made up really just a small fraction of this influx. And by 1958, the local Chamber of Commerce advertised Huntsville either as Rocket City, USA, or as the space capital of the universe. And for those of you who are more familiar with Huntsville, this billboard stood on South Memorial Parkway near Lily Flag Road, that intersection. The German families had already become somewhat accustomed with American life in Texas, but now enjoyed the freedoms that come with living off base. They built houses, sent their children to the local schools, and many soon actively contributed to the community. So much so, in fact, that despite their relatively small numbers among the thousands of newcomers, the Germans gained the reputation for being the main contributors to the town's educational and cultural development. Most civilians were excited for the potential opportunities that the newcomers promised and welcomed German and non-German arrivals with a party organized by the local Chamber of Commerce. And in 1955, many even joined the celebrations that followed a naturalization ceremony for the German families at the local high school. So at this point, most of them had become naturalized citizens. As I learned in my interviews, at least the white residents of Huntsville often did not think of the Germans as foreigners, despite their German accents, let alone as former Nazis. At least two of my interviewees explained that everyone was preoccupied with the goal to build rockets for the nation's defense and later to beat the Soviet Union in the race to the moon, so that the German team's foreignness and role in Hitler's regime was not a concern. In addition to bringing expertise and jobs with them, one of my interviewees explained that Werner von Braun sort of looked, quote, like a distant cousin. You can maybe see what she was getting at if you look at the photograph that Huntsvillians would have seen in the local newspaper when the plan to move the German rocketeers to Redstone was first announced. I'm sorry I don't have a better resolution picture, um, but this is actually a picture of von Braun with his wife Maria and their daughter Iris, or Iris. And I would venture to say that if you did not know differently, you might have assumed that this is a perfect representation of the 1950s ideal of an American couple. My German interviewees mirrored their neighbors and former co-workers' sentiments, some even recalling how surprised they were at the friendly reception they received in Huntsville. But Huntsville was not made up of white people, let alone Christians, alone. And its residents experienced the changes the town underwent quite differently. 
While many white residents benefited economically from the influx of new jobs and saw a diversification in educational and cultural choices, African American residents could rarely take advantage of these opportunities thanks to Jim Crow laws and its repercussions. And while more Jews moved to the area to work for the Army and NASA, they remained a small minority that had to contend with an overwhelmingly Christian environment. Moreover, an increase in jobs and industries related to rocket development did not translate to prosperity for those who had no or only limited technical or administrative skills. In a region in which the economy had been based primarily in textile mills and agriculture, the changes that had started earlier, but were now even more pronounced, resulted in the loss of jobs and few options for those whose skills did not translate easily. As these tables show, while the percentage of white residents increased between 1950 and 1970, the percentage of the black population actually shrank from 36% to 12% of the overall population by 1970. And while the Jewish population grew in numbers, it too shrank percentage-wise. When I spoke to members of the Jewish and African American communities about the arrival of the Germans, the tone was strikingly different from that of my white Christian interviewees. One member of the Jewish community whose family had been in Huntsville for multiple generations recalled that her father would not let her go on a date with the son of one of the German families because, as he explained, Germans never change. This attitude should not be too surprising considering that he had received many requests for help from Jews trying to escape Germany during the war. Another interviewee recalled with his father that his grandfather would retreat when he heard someone with a German accent enter his business and prefer to let someone else serve the customer in his stead. This same man had told his son and grandson about his dealings with German POWs who were kept at Redstone Arsenal during the war and who insulted him in German for being Jewish, thinking that he would not understand them. The people I interviewed in the African American community had yet another reaction to the German rocketeers and their families, which reflected the effects of racial segregation under the Jim Crow system at the time. Generally, my interviewees explained that the arrival of the German families did not stand out in their memory. From their perspective, the Germans were simply part of the larger white community of Huntsville. If anything, the Germans reminded them of the humiliation experienced during the war when white locals treated German POWs with more respect than their black neighbors at the same time that African-American troops were fighting Nazi Germany. And as one interviewee pointed out, when Huntsville held celebrations for the newcomers in 1950 in order to, quote, create continued harmonious relations between the various segments of the Huntsville population, end quote, African-Americans were not invited. Thanks to Jim Crow, the German families had more privileges even before they became American citizens than local Afri uh, African Americans. So unless particularly in tune with the Jewish or African American communities, most Huntsvillians, including the German families, would have been unaware of these sentiments in their midst. In the meantime, von Braun was becoming a household name across the country. While the German team continued to work on the development of guided missiles at Redstone Arsenal, in 1956 they transferred to the newly created Army Ballistic Missile Agency, short ABMA, where von Braun was the technical director and his colleagues from Germany filled most of the top leadership roles. And here's a picture of the lab directors for ABMA in June 1959, all of which were members of the German team two of whom I was very fortunate to actually get a chance to interview for this project. At the same time, von Braun was publishing exciting articles about ideas for space exploration in Collier's magazine in the early 1950s. Whoops, that went too far. Sorry about that. He continued to, he contributed to books with titles like Across the Space Frontier and Conquest of the Moon and worked with Walt Disney on producing popular shows that aired on ABC in 1955 and 1957 to help promote Tomorrowland, one of the sections in the new Disneyland theme park in California. And here you see him with Walt Disney in 1954. The successful launch of the first US satellite, Explorer One, 
on January 31st, 1958, demonstrated that these were not unrealistic fantasies and provided the entire rocket team with their first national recognition. Less than four months after the launch of Sputnik 1 had shocked the world public into believing that the Soviet Union may be scientifically and technically more advanced than the United States, and after the Navy's Vanguard rocket had exploded on its launch pad in front of a large TV audience on December 6, 1957, the Redstone team had saved the day and restored Americans' faith in their country's capabilities. And so here you see a photo that was taken a few hours after the launch showing the director of JPL, William H. Pickering, James Van Allen, whose team had built the instrument on Explorer 1, and Van von Baun holding up a model of the satellite at a news conference in Washington, D.C. Huntsville joined the celebration of this milestone and those that followed. The rocket team's successes became the town's successes. In 1960, NASA established the Marshall Space Flight Center at Redstone Arsenal, and 4,700 ABMA civilian employees transferred to Marshall on July 1st with most of the same leadership team. President Kennedy then famously announced in 1961 the nation's goal to put the first human on the moon within the decade, which became the main focus for the Marshall Space Flight Center for the following years. The center developed the powerful Saturn V rocket, which allowed Neil Armstrong to set the first human step on the moon on July 20th, 1969. And this is where the picture comes from. You saw on the flyers come, um, when you came in. Huntsville citizens are carrying von Braun on their shoulders in celebration of the Apollo 11 mission. Despite these monumental successes, or some might argue actually because of them, NASA decided to scale down its workforce. The mission was accomplished and there seemed to be little political incentive to keep pouring federal money into the program. Von Braun was offered an assignment at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., and the German rocketeers began retiring in the 1970s, although some remained with Marshall until the 1980s. Until this point, few people publicly questioned Project Paperclip or the German rocket team's involvement in the Third Reich. One exception was the comedian Mort Saal, who suggested that the subtitle for Columbia Pictures' 1960 feature film about von Braun's life, I Aim at the Stars, should have been, and sometimes I hit London. <laughs> <laughs> Many of you have probably also heard Tom Lehrer's biting lyrics in his famous 1965 song about von Braun, in which he sings, once the rockets are up, I'm not doing a German accent, okay? Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. But none of this was really threatening. Most Americans were probably happy to have von Braun and the German team on their side of the Cold War. Even when public knowledge about the use of concentration camp labor to build the V-2 rockets grew, most people who were interested in the German rocket team accepted the story promulgated by von Braun and some of his colleagues that it had been the notorious SS that was in charge of the concentration camp laborers and that the rocketeers had nothing to do with their treatment. This changed drastically in the 1980s, however, when the recently formed Office of Special Investigations for the U.S. Department of Justice, which I will refer to from now on as the OSI, accused one of the German team members from Huntsville of having committed war crimes during World War II. In October of 1984, local residents read in the Huntsville Times that Arthur Rudolph, the former project manager for the Saturn V moon rocket, had left the country and renounced his American citizenship after signing an affidavit in which the OSI alleged that he had committed war crimes when he was the production manager for the V-2 rockets under the Nazi regime. And here is a picture of Rudolph holding a model of the Saturn V rocket. Huntsvillians learned about the events from the newspaper because Rudolph, who had retired just before the moon landings, no longer lived in Huntsville at this point. He and his wife had moved to live near their daughter in California. In the book, I provide details about the case against Rudolph in the U.S., Canada, and later in Germany, but here I'm going to focus on the impact of the OSI's accusations. The developments came as a surprise for most Americans who had thought of von Braun and his colleagues as quote-unquote good Nazis but it caused outrage among many of the German rocket team's neighbors 
and former colleagues in Huntsville. Some investigative reporters began questioning the integrity of the entire operation that brought the Germans to this country, publishing their own research findings based on files they had requested for release under the Freedom of Information Act, and suggesting that there were probably other war criminals in the United States thanks to Project Paperclip. Soon the national media portrayed those who were brought here in a very different light, especially the German rocket team. One of the most effective strategies to change the narrative about the German team was to juxtapose the voices of survivors of the concentration camp from which the laborers for the V2 rockets were brought in with the voices of von Braun and Rudolf talking about the production site. This clash of presumed perpetrator and victim created a powerful contrast that made it difficult to view the rocketeers as innocent bystanders to the treatment of the regime's victims. In the meantime, a new surge of monographs about von Braun and his team appeared in the US and Germany, reflecting a debate over the meaning of the team members' work for the Nazi regime and the use of concentration camp labor to build the V2s. While American TV stations had been fairly quiet on the subject since an initial devastating frontline piece in 1987, they aired more explicit documentaries again beginning in 2000, which now always included references to the use of concentration camp labor to build the rockets for Hitler's regime. Even the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum changed its exhibit of the V2 rocket in an effort in 1990 to include the societal impact of technology in its presentation of artifacts. Previously, the exhibit of the V2 discussed the rocket's role as a technological forerunner of long-range ballistic missiles and launchers of satellites. But now it included images of von Braun briefing uniformed German officers, of the corpses of victims of the V2 bomb bombings in Belgium, and of concentration camp laborers at the site at which the rocket was produced. The Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center in Hutchinson, Kansas, went a step further in 1997, creating an exhibit for the V2 with an explicit focus on the Nazi regime and displays illustrating the use of concentration camp labor. But while the national image of the German rocketeers was changing, the initial shock and disbelief that Rudolf's supporters in Huntsville experienced developed into many years of heightened activity to counter the allegations. Most were certain that Rudolf had, quote, done nothing wrong. They were grateful for the German team's contributions to American rocketry development, but also for their contributions to Huntsville's prosperity, and believed that Rudolf deserved to be celebrated, not driven out of the country. They encouraged him to fight the allegations, collected money for a potential trial, appealed to politicians, including President Reagan at the time, and even tried to bring Rudolf back into the country via Canada. Some saw Rudolf as the victim of overzealous bureaucrats, while others descended to using anti-Semitic allegations against Rudolf's accusers or even outright Holocaust denial. <clears throat> Because of the Germans' prominence in town, the Huntsville Times continually reported on the developments of Rudolf's case and even requested his files from the OSI. Letters to the editor displayed sustained interest and controversy even years after Rudolf passed away in 1996. To many who had raised their families alongside the Germans, the accusations against Rudolf seemed incompatible with their experiences. That said, individual responses to the Rudolf case seem to depend more on their position vis-a-vis -vis the German and American pasts. Overall, my non-German white Christians, interviewees, Christian interviewees, sorry, expressed disappointment and even shame over how the US government handled the Rudolf case. They were more willing to give Rudolf the benefit of the doubt and tended to compare his situation to their own life experiences, which would often lead to a trivialization of the crimes Rudolf had been accused of. Members of the Jewish community, on the other hand, had been surprised to learn about the allegations, but seemed to have no doubt that Rudolf was guilty. One interviewee explained that people in the Jewish community assumed that the German rocketeers had, quote, things in their past. But since they worked with them at NASA and Redstone, they had not openly voiced their concerns. The allegations against Rudolf, along with letters to the editor of the Huntsville Times that reflected anti-Semitic sentiments in response to the Rudolf case, confirmed their suspicions. 
One of my interviewees differentiated explicitly between the Rocketeers and their children, but another admitted that the allegations against Rudolf changed how she thinks about all of the Germans in town. <clears throat> in contrast to most white residents of Huntsville, my African American interviewees barely knew whom I was referring to when I asked them about the Rudolph case, but some were aware of its implications. The conversation would either fall flat or turn into a review of the correlations between the use of slave labor in Germany and the United States, implying that white Americans and Germans share a disturbing history. Even after decades of living in a legally integrated society, the limited contact between African Americans in Huntsville and the German group meant that Rudolf's fates did not seem connected to their lives, except as a reminder of two racist systems. As you might imagine, the accusations against Rudolf had the greatest impact on the German community. Some worried that the OSI investigations might not stop with Rudolf. In fact, two other team members had been contacted by the OSI soon after the news about Rudolf made the headlines. But after their attorney stepped in, they were never contacted again. While many interviewees confirmed that the Rudolf case had a significant effect, it was mainly members of the second generation that recalled their parents' reactions in more detail. They seemed to identify with their parents and with Rudolf, contending that Rudolf was, like their parents, not guilty of any crimes. Many argued that Americans cannot understand what it means to live under a totalitarian regime, and most believed that their parents were victims of the Nazi regime and an ungrateful US government. Both had presumably used them. All right, by way of conclusion, let me make a few last points. I've tried to condense a very complex topic with many nuances into 30 to 40 minutes, which does not seem to do the subject justice, but hopefully it has raised your interest in learning more. Understanding what and how things happened under the Nazi regime is difficult for anyone studying the topic, let alone for those whose families experienced it, whether as victims, perpetrators, or as observers. Negotiating how to interpret the information available about this past is emotional, confusing, and often overwhelming. One of the problems the Third Reich created for its survivors and their descendants is that there seems to be no simple victim-perpetrator binary. Those who were perpetrators in one context were often victims in another. The confusion increases when one has to grapple with accusations that turn a family member or a friend whom one has thought of primarily as a victim into a perpetrator. Having to make sense of this in the context of the United States, where the Holocaust and Nazi regime are always considered the history of others, is particularly challenging. <laughs> Ultimately, the Rudolf case was the catalyst that changed how the team would re be remembered in the United States. Instead of being celebrated only for their contributions to America's military and space programs, to some, the German rocket specialists now have what one of my interviewees referred to as a dark side. In Huntsville, however, their positive image seems hardly affected as the town continues to commemorate and celebrate members of the German team as local heroes. Here, their critics are still barely visible to outsiders, but according to one local commentator, quote, each year the cheering section seems a little smaller. More and more people are inclined to look for the whole story, not just the hero story. Thank you. I'm sorry? I didn't identify it, um, yes, because I wanted somebody to ask about it. So this is a picture I took actually at the memorial site at the Dora, uh, Middlebau Dora, the concentration camp um, where the V-2 rockets, where the people who were building the V-2 rockets were, came out of. Sorry, didn't say that right. Yes. So that session would be representative of the slave labor of the public. Exactly. This is commemorating the victims. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and we thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. We do have some time for questions. We do just ask that you wait for a microphone so that we can record your uh, questions. Ah, nice. Thank you. Right here. Oh, the microphone. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> uh, in the 70s, I met a, a German couple in Austria skiing that lived in Huntsville. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, I never uh, thought about it. Do you know if, if there were any more deported or uh, 
for Nazi crimes other than Mr. Rudolph? Not from that group, no. Okay. Have no, uh-uh. How many descendants of these German people that worked on the rockets are still in Huntsville? Oh, um, I don't have an exact number, but a lot of the children stayed in Huntsville. You know, they grew up as Southerners, as Huntsvilleans, so they think of themselves as, you know, that's their hometown. Some have moved away, and I did interview a few people basically across the, mainly the Northeast as, and um, in the Appalachian as well. So, um, I don't know if you take an average of maybe two children per family, something like that. Yeah, a lot of them stayed. They're still there. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have the number. Uh, it, it seems uh, he had a Dr. Rudolph uh, died about 20 years ago, so I suppose we'll never establish whether or not the allegations are true. But you did not uh, state what were the allegations uh, against him. Okay, so. Um, I don't go into a lot of detail because I, I do it in the book as best as I can because it's really complex. Um, and, you know, the, the, what's complex about it really is how the different um, legal systems dealt with it, right? So for the OSI, they really just had to establish enough in order to be able to uh, have a denaturalization trial, which is not the same as actually convicting someone of war crimes, right? Um, and they actually never got to that point, right? So they didn't actually have to release all of their documentation that they used because, they, because he already signed the affidavit. He never went to trial with this in, in the US, United States, right? He signed the affidavit and left and said, okay, I don't want to have to deal with this. Um, so the allegations were basically um, that he had been a perpetrator that he uh, in the uh, production site for the V-2 rockets that he um, was in charge of dealing with the um, slave laborers. And, and, and in fact, we actually do have um, for a confirmation that he did order more concentration camp laborers, which, you know, is considered part of a war crime. Was that the site under the mountain, the worst one? Right. Yes. So... Um, I don't know if I need to go into detail about that, but yeah, there's, that's what this uh, memorial is from, is near that site under the, in the Kronstein Mountain, uh, near Nordhausen, which is in the, in the middle of Germany, basically. I'm sorry, I didn't bring any maps of Germany for this. I'm sorry, we have uh, someone here. Yeah, I was wondering if you could comment on Eric Lichtbeil's book, The Nazi Next Door, and what it said about the complicity or the knowledge of the U.S. government in bringing uh, uh, von Braun and his team here, and the light it might have shed on uh, some of the people in Huntsville. Okay, that's really embarrassing that I have to say I have the book, but I haven't read it yet. Um, and I know I should have. Uh, this would be a good, a perfect opportunity to talk. But I think the complicity, um, and I don't know what he says exactly, so I can't speak to that. But what I can t say is I think um, that's been part of the contention, right? Part of the contention has been what were the motivating factors to keep them here and what did we close our eyes on, right? What did we say, you know, in light of security issues, in light of the Cold War, in light of trying to keep communism out, et cetera, uh, what are we willing to do? And, um, and so, you know, you know, there are plenty of people who would argue that we did the wrong thing and we shouldn't have done this and we should have sent them back, oh, by the way, right, right away. Um, I guess the question has to be, you know, what did people know and their, you know, did they actually know what was going on? And that's part of the difficulty of evaluating this, right? What did the people who were saying they should be brought here and should be kept here know for a fact? Um, when I was doing my research just on the rocket team, um, I tried to go through the files and see how the negotiations went that took two years basically in order to then say, okay, they can come as immigrants. And um, there were a lot of security files created. There was a lot of you know, attempts to try to filter out who are we actually bringing here, right? Um, using whatever they could find um, in Germany, right? Depending on which area they, they had come from, the files may not be available, right? So if it had been in the, what was then the Soviet zone, you couldn't actually get to the files, right? You couldn't actually interview people about them. Um, so it's, it's a hodgepodge of information that people actually had at the time to make these decisions. 
There were some decisions made that said, you know what, it really doesn't matter at this point anymore. We're, we're trying to fight the communists, and what they did under the Nazi regime, as in what their ideology is, is not of our concern, right? So, yeah. I, I had seen a documentary that recently that, uh, that the slave labor, that the, they were just stacked up like cordwood, that they died and were starved to death in that tunnel, the actual tunnel where they were building the B2s. Was yeah. there, I guess, no uh, questioning? at the time, a paper clip to who was running it or? Uh, so this is part of, again, you know, so the people who went in, the, the U.S. military that went in, in fact, actually one of my interviewees belonged to the 104th Division. Um, so he had been part of that, that went in and actually liberated the camp. Um, and what they found were, um, you know, they, they found, of course, these piles of, of dead people, but also people who were barely alive, right? Um, sorting through that, there's, there's a lot of literature on this, sorting through that for the, for the militaries, on all the allied militaries, basically, was very tricky. And in this particular context, the belief was that the SS was in charge, had been taken, and they were the ones who had been in charge of the laborers, and therefore they were the ones in, char in charge of what happened to them. Um, and there were trials in Germany, for instance, in 1947, where some of the management of that particular Mittelwerk um, was taken to trial, right? But none of the Germans that were ended up here in Huntsville um, were, you know, they were not taken to trial for that, they actually um, gave affidavits, but that's it, right? Yeah. Of the first generation Germans, how many were you able to, to actually interview? Right, so um, this, I did my research in 2006, 2007, um, so you can imagine that a lot of them were not around anymore. Um, I, I would say, I actually didn't count this, I thought I should do that before I came over here, maybe um, seven or eight of the men, of the rocketeers, right? And then many more of the widows. So I spoke to actually a lot of the first generation women, um, which gives you an interesting, different contextualization. We have an arm back there raised. Oh, and up here as well, so maybe here first. You mentioned that the Germans acquired a reputation for assisting in the educational development of Huntsville. Did that work across racial lines? Were they as interested in what was going on up at A&M as they were in building up UAH or as in the Huntsville City Schools as they were in building up white flight areas such as Madison? Um, so from what I understand, they actually did teach at A&M a couple of courses, so there was some of that. Um, but when von Braun really made, I mean, von Braun was the leader of this, right? So he was really the one who made most of the efforts in for legislature, in Alabama legislature. He, he, and he was the one who managed to get money in order to build up UAH, right? Which was at the time obviously not for black students. Um, so from the perspective of the African Americans, uh, they basically created more competition and made things difficult. On the other hand, I also had the mayor of Triana tell me, who was African American, it's an African American community right outside Redstone Arsenal, um, he said, you know, he tried very hard to get A&M to bring in engineering to the school, and, and, for, and he was saying that basically the repercussions of of segregation and of, of uh, Jim Crow is what kept the school itself from wanting to bring this in. That was his response to my question about this. Um, so I don't think, again, it was a simple clear cut, right? Did they support or not support? Um, the reason there was support at some point was because of the federal money coming in, right? That's the real driving force. The federal money was tied to you have to desegregate and you have to bring in a different workforce. You cannot just have white workers. And that affects the whole town. That affects, affects also how Von Brown talks to the town, right? And says, if we're going to work with you, you contractor or whatever, you know, you're going to have to do the same thing. So. It's not your area of expertise, but in uh, doing your research, did you ever find out how the Germans fared in the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union brought I did, back? yeah, sure. Yeah, you, I mean, I thought that would be of interest, right? And uh, so um, basically those that stayed behind and didn't want to leave, 
literally, that didn't want to leave Germany and didn't want to leave their hometowns, um, they obviously saw themselves overrun at some point, right, by the, by the Soviet Union. And at first, um, they were actually working still at that place in, near Nordhausen, right? Um, and then it was kind of a whisk overnight when uh, military forces basically told them, you pack up, we're leaving now. So their families, they and their families were brought to the Soviet Union to work with whom now we know, you know, would have been Korolev, right? Um, on the Soviet, uh, but, but, but for a very brief time, really only long enough to transfer their, what they knew, right? And to show basically Russians, here's what we did and here's how the V2 works. Which by the way, I'm sure you know that the, you know, that both rocket systems that ended up um, flying into space were built on, built based on the V2 rocket, right? And that's why. But they were then as soon, so by 1950, most of them were sent back to East Germany. Yes. Uh, how many of the people that came to the Alabama went to the U.S. were actually members of the Nazi party? Okay, so um, the Nazi organizations, there were many of them, right? And being a member of the Nazi party was not the only criterion, if you will. Um, but uh, most, most of them would have been members of the Nazi party, of course. Yeah, there's that's, that's, that's almost like no way around that under that system, especially if you're working. They were, you know, they, many of them came out of the military. They had been sent to the, a lot of them had sent, been sent to the Eastern Front, and they were pulled off because they had some technical expertise. So they were thrilled, right, to get out of having to stand up there at the front, one of the worst parts of the war, right, and be able to work on something. They didn't know at the time where they were going until they actually ended up in Peenemünde, which is where this, uh, the development was happening. Um, so yeah, they, um, many of them would have been members just by virtue of being, being part, of the, part of the system. But again, so when you look at the files, which I have, I mean, I've looked at them a lot, they were members of all sorts of organizations, right? So all sorts of Nazi-affiliated organizations. It's not just the Nazi party. Yeah. Did you interview anybody in German, and it did it make a difference if you interviewed in German or English? Great question. Yeah, so actually what's really interesting is I offered. I did tell them that I'd have to translate it afterwards, because I obviously can't share that, uh, the, the German version uh, with my readers. Um, but most of them didn't want to. Most of them felt, uh, felt more comfortable in English than in German. Now afterwards, so once they had, I guess, become comfortable with me, then we started speaking German, right? So then, you know, and then they wanted to know more about me since I had just, you know, learned everything about them. So, um, but yeah, it, I think what was fascinating was that sometimes they forgot probably that I was German and started explaining Germany to me and explaining German culture to me, which is understandable, right? Um, so it was a, a somewhat of a negotiation back and forth, and I think the fact that I am German made a big difference, absolutely. You, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, dealing with African-American colleges and so forth. Did they ever, in your interviews with the scientist, did they ever express any uh, opinion or any uh, view about segregation or Jim Crow? Because, you know, the, the, the Jewish refugees, of course, who came before the war and the survivors who came south, that was one of the things that I think most shocked them about, about coming because they immediately identified that with their previous experience. I was just wondering if there was any uh, opinion or view they might have had about segregation and living in the segregated South. Yeah, I have a whole chapter on that. <laughs> so, um, how do I summarize that? But, um, many of them immediately, when I asked them what it was like to come to Huntsville, now they had come from Fort Bliss, Texas, right? Um, many of them said they were just very surprised 
and they would give you the standard, you know, of the separate segregated water fountains, you know, and then the standard joke about, you know, colored water, um, you know, that kind of thing is is what came up. But then they also they they told me about how they tried to negotiate this, like, in, you know, in their, they, did, they wouldn't have used the term negotiation, but they start, started talking about the things that they did in order to make the relationship better when they were actually confronted with it. So, for instance, a lot of them would have had housemates, right, domestic servants in their, in their employ. Um, and so I would get stories about how they, um, would you know ha have dinner with them together or have lunch with them together and how they were doing things th that they thought they were doing differently than other white Huntsvillians, right? They were so they were basically trying to explain to me how they had a different upbringing and a different relationship, but they never put it together with what was going on in Germany when they were adults, right? And when the same basically the same system, right? They didn't put those two things together. Not the first generation. Now the second generation, I did get that, right? You know, several times actually. And they, I think, grappled much more with this history than the first generation, at least openly. Again, we have to remember, and I said this, I think, in the beginning, you know, even in, I mean, not just even, in Germany, a lot of people of that generation didn't want to talk. For whatever their reasons were, most people did not want to talk about what it was like. And um, so you get a similar kind of response here with these Germans. Only, I guess what, I'm, what I think is different here is really that because of the context, because they were in the United States, because they were being celebrated for their skills, et cetera, and because here people didn't have that baggage of the history directly, right, the same, same history, they weren't questioned about it. Right? They didn't have to grapple with it in the same way that they would have if they had remained in Germany. And you can tell the difference, actually, because some people came in the 50s, and I did interview people in the 50s that came later, right? And they speak very differently. It's really interesting, because they had already experienced, you know, years of post-war Germany of trying to deal with what had been going on. Okay, we're just about out of time. I want to thank everyone for coming, and I want to thank Dr. Laney again for giving the thank presentation you, yeah. today. Thank you. And if anyone has any other questions, feel free to come on up. Yes. Thank you very much.